Hello everybody, my name is Alvaro Machado Diaz, I'm a neuroscientist and I'm very pleased that you join us today. This is the second session of the Digital Transformation and the Future of Work Symposium. During this event, keep an eye on the live chat as you will receive all the necessary information there. At the end of the event, we'll have a live Q&A session, so feel free to send us your questions in the chat. And now, we're going to continue our panel on today's most timely topic we could be thinking about, the future of work. Yesterday, we explored how automation and artificial intelligence impact both large companies and startups. Today, we're going to continue in this topic but with the focus on how these changes affected the labor market and what skills you should acquire to adapt and keep up with the changing requirements. The first thing that you already experienced is that we are all working and studying from home now. But will it keep being the same in the future? According to recent news, Google and Facebook announced it, that their workers will be at home until the rest of the year. Twitter has announced that its employees will be at home from now on. We can see that more and more companies will keep their workforce remote. It basically means that we all have to be tech savvy to remain relevant in the labor market. But what about traditional businesses? Imagine, for example, barbers, nail saloons, coffee shops, or bars. Is there any future for traditional businesses in the post-COVID world? I would like to ask this question to Professor Paolo Bellamoli. He's the director of the international projects at Kuola Business School and the senior consultant at the United Nations Industrial Developmental Organization. Professor Bellamoli, with your vast experience in business development in Europe and abroad, over the last years, you had a chance of observing several changes in the business world, affecting the way companies thrive in their markets and how people develop their careers now. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, so our audience is composed by young professionals and managers who want to think and plan their future in joint opportunities that these changes may bring. Thinking of the future of business, my first question to you is, what are the business models that have a bigger chance to succeed in the next decade? Do you see a bright future for traditional business companies? Well, interesting question. Um, in my point, from my point of view, uh, traditional companies have uh, a lot of opportunities. Their future uh, can be really bright if they proactively um, and uh, positively uh, embrace the digital transformation and the digital technologies and the opportunities of growth that uh, come with the digital transformation. Actually, thanks to the digital transformation, companies uh, of any kind can grow in different terms. They can grow in their scope of the product and services they do. They can grow in terms of speed, of course, this is very clear. And they can grow in terms of scale. Um, of course, they need to develop the right strategy to uh, embrace the digital transformation. This can be done in different ways. And any company has to find uh, its own way, its uh, most appropriate way. Uh, it can be uh, an internal uh, gaining of competencies uh, or it can be an association with partnering with a digital company. Uh, but the, the point is uh, to uh, put the key uh, competencies uh, and uh, assets uh, that the, digital, the different partners have. And uh, in this regard, the main asset that a traditional that so-called traditional com company or incumbent company in the market has. The main asset is data. They have uh, data on uh, historical data on customers. Uh, they have data on the products, the processes, production. They have data on uh, the market. And uh, this is something that uh, the new startup companies don't have. But uh, leveraging on this data, they can uh, uh, 
grow as I said uh, in scope scale and speed and something in common probably of this uh, possibility of growth it's uh, a transformation from a business model based uh, simply on a, a product a product that is manufactured and sold to something that is uh, uh, more looking at the whole life cycle of the business they, they are in uh, and also to a uh, inflow and uh, to revenues that leverage more and more not only on the product itself but on services that can be associated to this product. I can think of uh, more than one example of companies that I met and uh, companies that we have actually worked with at Poor Business School. Uh, examples of uh, traditional companies. First example that comes to my mind, for example, is a company that is uh, uh, producing uh, equipment for uh, concrete production in construction sites. It's uh, not a big company, it's a medium-sized company in, uh, located uh, in uh, the province of not a big city here in uh, north of Italy. But uh, they uh, actually are very innovative in this uh, traditional sector, uh, leveraging uh, on uh, new technologies uh, they developed uh, in the house, for example, in, uh, in terms of sensors that they introduced uh, in the equipment to manufacture and pour concrete, concrete in the construction site. So now from their headquarters uh, in, uh, in Italy, they can uh, um, run and take full control of uh, concrete production uh, in a construction site uh, in India. They can uh, support their clients uh, with a wealth of services um, spanning from uh, optimizing uh, energy consumption, water consumption, uh, maintenance uh, uh, processes, uh, of course through predictive maintenance but also uh, the regular maintenance uh, of the day-to-day -day running of the business. So um, they are transforming themselves uh, using this uh, new technology. They are adding services uh, and uh, uh, the latest thing they have started uh, and the project we have been working with them is 3D printing. So they now are, they are developing a system to pour concrete uh, in the construction site of a dam, for example, or water dam, to a big, huge, mega 3D printer. So, traditional business, traditional company, but very, very much with a bright future in my point of view. But there are other examples of traditional companies that come to my mind. For example, what about coffee? Coffee uh, seems uh, something very much traditional, um, still, uh, a lot of opportunities are there, also in the coffee business. Uh, with uh, the International MBA, for example, we have involved uh, students uh, with uh, a project uh, with a coffee company that is uh, uh, developing and implementing a new device uh, in the coffee machines at bars and restaurants uh, around the world. So these uh, uh, coffee machines uh, have been enhanced uh, with uh, sensors uh, and collect, uh, collection of new data. And these data are shared uh, with uh, the headquarters of the coffee, coffee company. What do they do with this data? Of course, they can provide a wealth of uh, suggestions and support and services uh, to the uh, owner of the bar and the restaurant in terms of uh, how to improve the actual production uh, of coffee. They, they can know real time which kind of coffee is uh, uh, requested by the customers uh, at different times of the day. They can uh, optimize uh, energy consumption, coffee consumption. They can uh, um, support, uh, of course, the, the, the planning of the warehouse. Uh, they can even uh, say and provide information to the owner on uh, uh, which waiter is doing what. There's really plenty of information they can uh, collect uh, and the full business model that they can develop uh, 
from these uh, uh, new kind of uh, information that they, they are they have access again they have data Great, thanks for sharing your points of view with us. You give a positive feel on the role of traditional companies considering the digital transformation. As you have just mentioned, automation and technology in general can be implemented e even in traditional businesses. But let us talk about more recent technological um, breakthroughs. For example, what is your take on, on these uh, buzzwords like blockchain and artificial intelligence that we're seeing everywhere? Uh, blockchain. Blockchain is a very interesting topic. I've been following and trying to understand the, the potential of blockchain from, for some years. Uh, and actually, it has the potential to be really uh, disruptive. But still, uh, my feeling is it so far it has been mainstreamed uh, mostly in uh, papers, uh, workshops, uh, uh, journalists, experts, uh, sometimes real experts, sometimes people that pretend to know, because uh, it is not a straightforward technology. It has, uh, like any technology, it has uh, uh, strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses. There are still some uh, hesitation, there are some uh, resistance, there are some risks perceived by the managers. Uh, it is also very much linked uh, to uh, the concept of cryptocurrencies, uh, which started in the beginning to be very popular, but uh, now uh, popularity has been challenged in, uh, in different ways and in different, different times. So um, the potential is there. But uh, I believe that uh, it still needs uh, time to, to be mainstreamed uh, and to be applied uh, to the full potential. Great. Thank you, Professor Bellamoli. Now, talking about professional development, what are the key competences a young manager should develop to enjoy this new reality? How can we get these competences? That's a hard one, isn't it? I would say uh, you should look at uh, uh, the combination of two things. Uh, specialization. So uh, a young person should very much look at uh, what is uh, his uh, or her passion, what is uh, driving, uh, ambitions um, should be looking at uh, how to do experimentation, be curious on that, and so specialize on this field to choose a sector, a field that is motivating it, uh, and specialize on that. At the same time, um, to build as much as possible also on so called soft skills. Because in a changing uh, job market and uh, in a, an environment that uh, uh, is featuring a, a big transformation also in the relationship between the employer and the employees, um, you should develop, uh, uh, you should very much develop skills related uh, to um, how to be ready and um, how to be uh, anticipating uh, and embracing change. So change management is a key skill that should be part of the portfolio of any management manager. Um, not only change management, but of course communication skills. More and more, in the past it wasn't so uh, a key competence, but communication skills will be for sure in the portfolio of any manager in the future, as well as uh, risk-taking uh, uh, and management, not only risk-taking uh, readiness, but uh, taking the risk in a managed way. So risk management is another thing to put in the portfolio, 
Another one is uh, uh, developing a sensitivity and uh, uh, mastering uh, uh, an approach linked very much to uh, collaboration, to uh, a culture that is uh, being interested in so many things and so many people and being interested in working in a collaborative way in the job market, in your own field and even if you are not in a firm anywhere with new opportunities. Uh, a key competence, of course, is leadership. It has been here for many years, of course, leadership was very much requested, but with a, a job market, a job environment that is rewarding more and more intrapreneurship. So your own initiatives uh, contributing to the overall results of your team. Leadership is a key skill to, to master. All right, thank you for sharing your opinion with us. I hope that our viewers will use some of the useful tips you gave. Nevertheless, in the middle of the pandemic, we can observe that many people become unemployed and that are struggling to find jobs. Talking about the job hunting, I have the pleasure of welcoming today in our chat, Professor Will Holt. He's the Dean of the Person Business School in London. Industrial engagement is primary focus, promoting several initiatives to get his students closer to the market. Professor Will, thank you for being with us today. When asked what you um, is to advise for a student, you once said uh, something like, think from an employer's perspective rather than a personal one. If a company is recruiting, then it is because there is a business need. If you can approach a role from the view of how um, you might uh, add value to that organization rather than just uh, focusing on what might be there for you would be better. This is a powerful statement. Do you consider that um, new professionals are approaching companies in a more of a self-oriented or even selfish manner? If so, uh, now here's a hard one. What have caused that move? So let me start um, perhaps just by clarifying the, the piece of advice that I, I originally gave. Um, and that was a piece of advice for, for new professionals coming into the workplace and how to really um, help to, to stand out and impress in their, their new roles. Um, and the advice that I gave was actually, it's, it's a common mistake to sometimes focus on the self and the individual and what you're trying to achieve from a role. Whereas actually adopting a, a slightly different perspective perhaps, and thinking about the perspective of the employer and why have they recruited you for that role? And your line manager and your line manager's line manager, what are they looking for you to do? What, what, are, what are the roles and the value that they're looking for you to add to the organization? Why was there a need for you to be brought into the organization in the first place? And how can you help satisfy that need? Just perhaps slightly adopting or perhaps slightly changing the mindset is quite a useful technique just to really understand the value that you bring to the organization. So to answer your question, do I think that uh, new professionals coming into the workplace are, are more selfish or more self self oriented No, I, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, we know from, from studies that uh, millennials are, are perhaps pickier and choosier about where they want to work. But that in itself is not a bad thing. In fact, actually, it's a very laudable thing. Um, what we're finding is that even with our own graduates here at Pearson College London, that they are in some cases turning down very high profile, very, very large, um, desirable roles with large organisations in favour of smaller organisations or different roles which better align with their own personal values and beliefs. That, that's absolutely correct and proper. You should always find a place where you want to thrive and which, which works well for you. So in itself, actually thinking about the question, is this the right place for me to work? And is this a type of environment where I can thrive and do well? There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Once you get to the point where you found a company which you can truly call home, a place where you think you can develop as an individual and you can develop your career, 
that's when I would strongly recommend that you adopt this, this mindset. So how can I really impress? How can I make a strong impact in the workplace? And that's where taking some time to think about why an employer has uh, employed you, has, has, has chosen you to come in, and the value that you can bring to the organisation to help it achieve its operational and strategic objectives, then that's a very useful mindset to adopt um, earlier on. Thank you, Professor Will, for sharing your opinion with us. Exploring this topic a bit more, I would like to know your opinion about the impact of the company profile on the recruiting process. By company profile, I mean large corporations versus small, medium-sized companies. In what sense um, the thinking from the employer's perspective change according to different companies' profiles? So to give you a simple answer, I think actually that, that, that mindset of looking at what an employer is looking for from you, as much as what are you, you looking for from an employer, applies to all types of organisations. Whether you're going into a large listed international organisation, whether you're joining a very new startup. The, the approach to, to really thinking from, from both perspectives is, is one that I would wholeheartedly recommend. So from that perspective, I don't think there's any difference across profiles. One of the things, uh, hopefully, that, that new professionals going into a, a new role or a new career have a given time to thinking about is what would be the right work environment for them. And that very much depends on the individual. So for some of our graduates at Pearson College London, going on to work in a large corporation, a large business, is absolutely the right move for them. They want the brand name, the, uh, the prestige, if you like, of working for, for such a large company, and also the certainty that that might bring um, in terms of salary, job security, and the role that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Others, other students are, are much more keen for variety in their role and to work in a slightly, perhaps more dynamic environment that would be afforded by a smaller business, by a smaller startup where they may be focusing on one key area of the business, but equally they have the opportunity to work across other parts of that organisation. And they thrive in that type of environment. So it really is an individual decision, thinking about aspects such as culture. Is this the right type of environment for me? Is this a place where I can actually progress my career? Is this a place where I can actually achieve what I want to achieve as an individual? These are all important questions to ask prior to deciding what type of organisation might be a good fit for you. Thank you, Professor Will. Now I would like to hear um, your perspective on the other side of the labour market. Do you have experiences with companies that hire without actual clarity about their own business needs? In other words, companies that understand that they lack personnel but that do not know for sure whether someone with profiles X, Y, or C would suit them better at that point? If so, how can a new professional spot that and respond, respond accordingly? So at Pearson College London, we work with a whole range of organizations. Again, very large listed companies down to very small startup companies, um, private sector companies, public companies, uh, professional bodies, all sorts of different employers. What we find in some cases is that uh, they're looking to recruit people onto general graduate schemes. And in that case, it probably isn't a specific skill set that they're looking for, but more certain aptitudes uh, and values which match those of the organisation. So do companies recruit without knowing specifically what they're looking for? I think the answer to that is, is sometimes yes. Yes, they do, uh, particularly where they're recruiting onto a general uh, management or graduate scheme where they intend for employees to move around the organisation in a variety of roles. So to that extent, yes, I think that does apply. One of the things I think we can say fairly universally uh, across employers is that they tend to recruit perhaps quite understandably, for the now, for the present, rather than for the future. 
So there may be an immediate uh, resource requirement or an immediate need within the business. But actually, as we know, we're in a period of, of the workplace at this particular point in time where goals are changing very, very quickly. And that's partly due to the uh, technological advances which have been made. But the workplace is changing and roles are changing. And one of the, the areas which I think employers are starting to give more consideration to is the future of the workplace and actually recruiting individuals now who can actually match the future needs and the future roles that that employer will require. Therefore, a piece of advice I'll give to all graduates and all, all current undergraduate students looking for their first career move is to really think about future workplace skills. More generally, looking at areas like technology, coding, uh, web design, analytical skills, but then looking within particular sectors that they might be interested in working in. What will a future role look like and what skills can I develop now that will stand me in good stead for the future? There are all sorts of research and publications around this. Pearson itself uh, does a lot of research in this. Um, there is a, a Workplace 2030 skills report available online, which I think is accessible um, free of charge uh, as an example. But there are many uh, documents out there which will help to give you an insight in terms of the future skills which employers in the workplace will require. And that I think is one way that current graduates looking for their next career move can start to think about now. What are the future skills required within my role or my sector that will help me to stand out in the future? Professor Will, um, thank you for your great contribution in our discussion today. As we can see, today's recruiting environment has never been more challenging. Most companies used to consider hiring people as a transaction. For example, they used to place a job posting and fill the job. In the new world, that will no longer be the case. To get the best talents, companies will have to engage people sooner and more thriftfully and put a higher priority on what employees value most in a job. Now, we're going to have a one minute break and then start our Q&A session, or in other words, our questions and answers question, session. I'll see you again in a minute. Hello everyone, I'm back now for a Q&A session, which is an opportunity to interact with you live here in our symposium. But first, I'm going to answer these questions that we have received in advance. Um, our first question comes from Shafiu Sunny from Nigeria, and he says, from my point of view, the use of artificial intelligence in carrying out some of the jobs that was initially done by human can undertake or sweep away many human jobs. So what is our plan in future to see that human beings do not lose their jobs? Um, well, um, I think that this is not a, by any means an easy question. And by that, I just don't, I, simply it's not just the case that it's complex. It, it is that it forces us to, to face um, um, harsh reality. And this harsh reality is that um, job replacements uh, will happen no matter what. And actually, they're already happening. Actually, if, if we go back in time, um, 
basically the, the technical progress is all about um, replacement of human um, or ultimate, uh, augmentation of human efforts, either mechanical or cognitive. And, and that, that's been around for at least 10,000 years. Um, what, what this is the big difference now is that the skills that are being replaced are just um, much more sophisticated and they sometimes are the best things we can put in, 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 in the workplace. So this is complicated. And in regard to that, what I think is that first thing, it is, um, it is important that around the world, um, workers um, try to update their skills, try to um, renew what they know, um, try to, to advance in knowledge because um, each time more, the bar is higher. So uh, you cannot, if there was a time where a professional career would allow you to do the same thing for 20 or maybe 30 years, um, this time is gone. So you have to really update your, your knowledge. As for those entering the market, um, which are the most of our viewers here, um, I think that the, the, the more uh, subtle thing is that um, the competition will be higher no matter what. And it's, it's important to, to understand that if you're having a hard time to find a job or if in the future you find yourself in that position, it's not necessarily your fault. Probably it isn't. It is the market that's very harsh and what's going on in the world will definitely need a solution which we don't foresee for now. Thank you. Okay, now we have a question from Godfrey uh, Mokobani and he says, based on um, the digital transformation happening around the world, what are the careers that young people can aspire in order to keep up with the job market? Or in a nutshell, what qualifications should young professionals be preparing themselves for today? That's that's a good one. Um, also a good one. It's 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 kind of complex to to respond in a simple matter. Good questions. That's why they are good. And this is a case of one. I would say first you have to have the inclination for what you're doing. Don't try to be artificial. Don't try to be an artificial intelligence. Try to find what you can do best because if comp competition is rising, um, that means that uh, the better will be better off each time more. So that's something important. Don't, don't try to make up a, a persona, uh, a professional persona for yourself because that probably won't work. That's something. Second thing, um, be aware that some of the changes that look that will be in place in five years or 10 years, um, 10 years ago were said to be in place in five years or 10 years. So don't believe the hype as I said yesterday, okay? It, it's, it's happening, but the time frame is not as short as some, some people imagine, especially because it's nice to, you know, talk about novelty, etc. So we're on the way, but our time frame for, for changing based on automation and um, artificial intelligence, blockchain, etc., it's more on a, a two decades base than one decade base, in my opinion. But yet, it will affect you anyway, so you have to think in, in that direction. Um, third, I think that in general, that, that's just general, okay? Um, things that have uh, soft skills involved or more um, protected from from the advance of automation and, and artificial intelligence. And that that is just another way to say that the the creature um, starts by eating its creator, which is a famous saying. So um, consider that whatever you do, even if you're inclined to be an engineer, which which I just think is a great um, um, profession with lots of opportunities and, and interesting challenges. Just think that you have to have that soft side um, to make yourself um, special, right? Thanks. Now, Ricardo from Brazil asks, will digital transformation pose new problems or just renew existing ones? For example, workers in the Industrial Revolution were waiting in front of factories to be called to work. Nowadays, they're waiting um, through applications. What will this process look like? Yeah, that's another interesting and hard question. Um, I would say that this one it has to be entangled from a historical perspective. 
Um, workers are uh, when in the Industrial Revolution, in a, especially the first Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, um, workers were actually recruited inside families as uh, specialist families, which were all over the all over UK and and rest of Europe and and later on um, in America. So actually, they were now waiting in in front of factories. But that was a fact. Some some few hundred years later in the, the first quarter of the 20th century. So yeah, there's a point there. And this point, um, it's not exactly correlated with um, the workers that um, are, are doing freelancing work and things like that in applications, because these are more like a blue, like the blue collars workers of today, okay? So that, that's the match. They're not factory workers. Um, in terms of factory workers, I think that the situation is getting harsh and period because automation is all over the place and, and that's it, as I said before. But um, for this other part of, of the job market, uh, blue collar and then white collar workers, um, in terms of, of these opportunities today, what I see is that um, there's lots, there's uh, thousands of opportunities to talk about, to, to be in the, in an application, in a freelancing application. The problem is actually not that. The real problem is that that sort of thing is not a job. So you may earn some money, you you know, you can uh, keep on with your life, but that's not a job. There, there's no security, there's no nothing that can um, guarantee to you that if you, if you fall sick or anything, you can have any sort of support. So that's a real problem. It's it's not that that something to do and earn some money is disappearing from the world or being restricted to some some uh, mind genius uh, specialized in, in AI or anything. It's just that the, there's something about the business mark the, the job markets that is changing and that uh, perhaps is not good for all workers. Thanks. So um, now we have some some questions that are coming online live and. I'm going to ask Julia to, to um, read them out so I can answer. Julia, please go ahead. So the first question we have is from Rosana Monteiro. And her question is, what kind of businesses suffer during this time of digitalization because, of their, because their sector requires more personal relationship and human contact? Are there ways to maintain this personal relationship and human contact alive despite this digitalization? OK. Um, I think that um, there are, uh, there's a plethora of businesses that um, are that face this sort of problem, and we couldn't um, just enumerate all of them. It wouldn't, wouldn't make any sense. But I can uh, mention some that are really facing a hard time, and one is is sales of anything related to um, the experiencing of purchasing. So, for instance. Um, the malls uh, that have been opened all over the world are facing low public and sp mostly because people cannot try on the closest. With, with, by the way, I think it's absolutely correct. I, I'm totally in favor of that. I'm totally in favor of social um, distancing. I think that, that health should always come in place, first place. But yet um, this is happening. And it's, it's a funny thing because uh, the the managers and the, and the sales personnel and the owners, everybody um, are really facing a sort of a paradoxical um, situation because when everything was exclusively on, online, they were settling a little bit because they were uh, sending things to, to people's house. People were trying them on, imagining how it would be to use them in a, in a close um, future, so on and so forth. And then suddenly um, the malls are open, and people, you know, cannot change. They, they cannot use the closet. They cannot, you know, try on. They cannot have the experience. They're realizing that uh, most of the interaction, um, the action that would be going on, uh, will take a little while. So they're not buying that much. So there's a, a, a plenty of examples like that that we should um, consider. Um, another, which is even more strong than than and shopping uh, and then stores and shopping centers, are obviously restaurants. So, restaurants um, most um, are I don't say most, but many of them are using delivery systems to to try to complement 
um, their their earns, but um, they're actually facing um, the hard situation because food is about experiencing something, and it's it's really live like this stock here. So it's it's very it's a very hard period for restaurants. And some some and it's 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 a funny thing because um, some situations um, some some crises of the world are more democratic than others. And this one has a sort of a democratic um, persp uh, feeling, because actually um, on the side of that, um, everybody is, is suffering a little because everybody is uh, scared of of uh, getting sick, or, or at least of, of making someone they they love sick. So, so I would say that all businesses, in some sense, are are suffering because business, in the end of the day, are just a bunch of people organized in terms of of something that they do from a practical perspective, but in a more deeper way, they, they exchange human feelings and and empathy. Um, all right, so our next question is from Nor Jane Makatimbo. Considering that technology is now playing a big role in several different markets and sectors, how can low-income communities and third world countries keep up without technological resources? Yeah. Um, yeah, this pretty much resembles the, the first one I, I answered in the sense that um, it, it, it comes from a, a premise that something can be done, and I don't think that's the actual case. I think that they're, they're developing countries are suffering and, and will suffer more. I think that inequality in the world is, 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 is rising, and basically I'm not alone in that, uh, many economists uh, point. Uh, to the same. On the other side, um, one thing that it's important to consider is that each time more agribusiness is representing a large chunk of all the exports from developing countries and and that, that trend uh, seems not to to stop anytime soon. So um, it's uh, on when when we think from the more uh, global perspective, and that that's not that's not something that to regret. Yet when when we look like uh, what, in terms of, of what's technological what's technology um, based, um, there is indeed a situation um, to be to be fought. And I think that those that have an opportunity really need to to put all their strength and and study and and update their curriculums and really learn stuff because that's going to matter a lot. So that's something. Another thing is for those um, that do not speak English, it, it's important to, to bear in mind that um, from, I don't know, maybe 10 years or something, English has become the, the new Esperanto in the world. So the, the new universal language. So um, each time more um, the home working and uh, etc. The digitalization will make people work from different places and and join companies um, that they never been to their offices, etc. So that sort of stuff needs a common language, needs a, uh, the capacity to write and and communicate perfectly. So you need to have that skill for sure. That's something. Um, all right, Alvaro. So our last and final question today is from Gianni Awatar. And the question is, how can companies take advantage of this high digitalization period um, in matters of marketing and advertising? Yeah, um, I think that some companies are like Google and Facebook. <laughs> so um, the, the question is on the other side of this equation. How can um, companies that are not in the business of marketing and uh, on uh, web marketing can do something to their benefit? And what I think is uh, each time more, uh, what we call organic marketing has an impact. Okay, so so we believed, everybody believed in the past. I, actually, I never believed, but anyway, it was a common saying that you just have to invest in Google and, and Facebook or whatever, Facebook ads and LinkedIn ads, etc., and that would do the job. That's not true at all. That's absolutely not true. Each time more, we know that you need an audience and your audience needs um, real content, something that really matter to them. Don't, don't, don't give them crap or don't, don't give them just pure advertisement. Um, you need to, 
to find those that talk with you, that understand what you mean, what you want, and actually what you have to offer to them, which is the most important part. I, I, for instance, my, my, my own company, we never advertised once in a life, but we do marketing, but we do just organic, and, and organic is just fine, because in the end of the day, uh, each time more, purchase is about trust. And trust is not built on, on, on something impersonal, but on rather something very personal, very human centric and very related to your truth. Thank you. So that's it. Um, unfortunately, I did not have a chance to answer all of the questions that we have received so many. But uh, please don't forget about the business case a study competition we are preparing for you. Okay, that, that's, that's something. Um, if you're interested in this subject, invite your colleagues and friends, select a company to analyze and send your papers to us. In case you did not manage to form a group yet, find the link to the Facebook page we created to facilitate the group formation process in the chat, okay? In, in this chat here. So the honors of the best papers we earned up to $100,000 in scholarships for international academic programs. I would like to thank you all once again for joining us. This was the Digital Transformation and the Future of Works Online Symposium organized by the IBS Americas with the support of universities of the United States, Europe, and Brazil. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.